Real, relevant, and relational, spirit-led and motivational, we are evangelizing the lost and empowering the believers, edifying Christians to stand bold as leaders, committed to building godly families and communities, and he's raising sinners to saints like you and me. People are being delivered here, lives restored and hearts revived. It's the same message, just a different method. Our God is being glorified. There's a place for the baby, the children, the youth. No watered down gospel, it's the unadulterated truth. Giving God our best, that's loving, serving, and giving more. And he's sending the rain, that's what we're digging the ditches for. Foot on the gas, overflowing in every season, and it ain't no one on ones. That's why we're so undefeated. We are that city on a hill, reaching souls in Memphis, Tennessee. Health, money. Business, baptism, spreading the gospel holistically. A family filled, diversified, non traditional worship experience. Chain breaking and life changing, bringing total deliverance. This is kingdom business. That's why we're serving with excellence. And outside the four walls, bringing church to your residence. No matter your background or situation Cause we ain't that church, we're this church So welcome to innovation We ain't that church, we're this church So welcome to innovation
Welcome to Innovation Church Memphis and thank you for joining our online experience. Whether you're joining us via Facebook Live, YouTube, or Innovation App, or our website, we are so excited that you get to experience innovation. Listen, you literally could have chose anywhere else to worship. And we thank you for choosing to worship with us here at Innovation Church Memphis. If this is your first time, you're considered as our VIP guest and we have something special just for you. Please click the link at the end of the service, and we would like to send you your special gift. Praise on the Lawn is next Sunday. That's right, Sunday, August the 23rd. We will have Praise on the Lawn. So listen, go and grab your lawn chair, your snacks, your family, and meet us at our main campus at 6.07 p.m. Listen, if you don't want to get out of the car at all, you don't have to get out of the car. So there is no excuse. Stay in the car and we'll put the sermon and the praise and worship on your station. We want to see you next Sunday. Stay tuned for more details of our aunt's Sunday weekend. Yes, listen, the pandemic may have canceled the normal way of celebrating, but we're innovative, right? So we're creating a new normal. It is going to be epic.
wonderful name of Jesus. For everybody that's tuning in, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Those that's tuning in all over the world, God bless you. God bless you. There's a word from the Lord for us on today. If you have your Bible with you, open it to St. Luke chapter 12. Looking at verse 16 through 21. St. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And it reads, And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Parlay, man. Kick it. Hang out. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it would be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. He said in verse 19, he says, And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, he said, man, I'm going to live it up. I'm going to live it up. I got all of this. Look at what I have. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I've done. I'm about to live it up. I want to talk to you today from the subject of living it up. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to say thank you. We thank you for this day and time. We thank you for who you are. You're amazing and holy, and we just bless your holy name. We pray in Jesus' mighty name that you open up our hearts and minds to receive from you. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. To us on the day. We'll ever praise you and give you glory and honor. It's in your holy son, Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. If you was in the building, I said, come on, give God a hand clap of praise. And while you're online, come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. As we look at what's taking place in our country and our nation, there's over 20 million people that's been diagnosed with the coronavirus. 12.8 million have recovered, and there's been 749 deaths recorded worldwide. In the U.S. alone, it's been over 5 million cases reported, and over 167,000 confirmed deaths. All within this year, some think it's a hoax, some think it's a joke, some think it's not serious, but all within this year, 749,000 people, over 749,000 people have lost their lives due to this illness. As I, as I look at it and think about it, this is a disease that many of us knew nothing about seven months ago. We knew nothing about it. Many of us have never heard of COVID-19, coronavirus. We never heard of, and now all of a sudden it is coming and, and so many people have lost their lives from this devastating virus. I was speaking to a, a young man and, and his dad passed of COVID-19. And when I talked to him, he, he was just devastated. He said, I feel like somebody has stolen my dad. He said, I feel like somebody stole my dad. Like this something that he said was, was cooked up in, 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 in a lab overseas has hit our country and just happened. Like how did he die of this? You look at what, what takes place to where just what, what, what's happening now and when you hospitalize and particularly hospitalized with the coronavirus, you, there's no visitors, and you can't see anyone. And so it's individuals that, that have to deal with this alone. And their loved ones can't come and see them and, and talk with them and, and pray with them. So dealing with this alone, let alone you're dealing with it, but, but you're dealing with it alone. How devastating that is. 
and all of a sudden, we, we didn't know anything about this, and so bam, all of a sudden, this has happened. And everybody's wearing masks, and you can't get in the restaurants that you have on a mask, and, and we don't know if we're going back to school. And yes, we're going back to school, and we're going back to school online, and, and, and is there going to be a football season, and the Big Ten canceling their football season, and some high schools are playing. I mean, and so how did we get to this point? How do, how do we get here? How do we, how do we get here? Who would have thought that we would be in this place? But we're here. Look at James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He said, man, don't, don't talk about what you're going to do tomorrow and the next day. Yeah, it's good to make plans, and that's awesome. But what you should say when you make plans, if it's the Lord's will, then we'll go here and we'll go there. If there's been no other time that you should say that, now is the time for us to say if it's God's will, then we would do this and we would do that. Lord willing, we would do this and we would do that because we've never known what the future holds. But, but now in these times, we don't know what tomorrow may bring. James said, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Man, do you not know what that is? Listen, in the King James Version, said, you are just a vapor. He said, we're, we're just a vapor. This is what the Word of God is saying about us. We're just a vapor. Life can feel endless at times, but the Bible reminds us that compared to eternity, an individual life on earth, it's like a vapor chased away by the morning sun. It is important to recognize the brevity of life so that we won't take it for granted. It's just a vapor. So, man, you, 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 you just here for a minute. You, you just, we, 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 we just, <laughs> in other words, do you know how insignificant you are? In other words, stop taking yourself so serious. In other words, whether you live 20 years or whether you live 120 years, it goes by like this. You are just a vapor. I was sharing at a funeral a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that I shared, I said, the thing that Martin Luther King, Biggie, Tupac, Michael Jackson, Prince, Ronald Reagan, and anybody that's lived over 150 years ago have in common, is that they all dead. Like, all of them, so unless God come back, then we, we all go into to this place. We're all going to enter into eternity. And so who are we living our lives for? What are we living our lives for? Jesus gave the parable about the rich man. He said, man, you're living your life for this stuff. You're living your life for the things. You're living your life to just live it up. But do you not know that God can come right now and say, give me that, give me that up off, give me that breath, give me that life up off of you. What are you living for? What are you living for? We just a vapor. Psalms 103, 14 through 16 says, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And this place remembers it. No more. My God. We got to realize that this place is not our home. I'm living this life just to live again. Oh, if I could sing, I'd say, oh, I'm living this life. Y'all don't want to have no church, though. I'm living this life just to live again and with the Lord. Y'all don't want to have, yeah, I ain't, ain't going to sing today. Y'all, I, I ain't, I ain't going to sing. We're going to leave that up to, uh, to, to the other people, to the worship team and all them folks. But I'm living this life just to live again. We live like there is no life after this life. We live as, this, as if this is it. One song said, this is just a rehearsal. When we get to heaven, we're going to really sing. This is just a rehearsal. We just here, man. We just here for a while. And whoever we live for in this world is who we're going to live with when we leave here. It's not our home. So... You're just a vapor. You're just a mist. On, on one hand, you're insignificant. But on another hand, you're very significant. 
But what did you tell me about, Pastor? You, you, you just said I was a miss, but listen to what, what Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. King James said, we are his masterpiece, my God. So we're his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So you're his handiwork. You're his masterpiece. You're created to do good works. Zechariah 2 and 8 says, For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touched you touches the apple of his eye. He said, you're the apple of his eye. So he said, we're his masterpiece. And then he said, we're the apple of his eye. Psalm 17 and 8 says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wing. My God, keep me as the apple of your eye. So in other words, if if you're thinking thinking too much of yourself, you need to understand that you're just a vapor. If you're thinking that you're all of that in a bag of chips, you need to know that you're just a vapor, you're just a miss. If you're thinking too low of yourself, you need to remind yourself that you are his masterpiece. You're the apple of his eye. So there's a tension between am I a masterpiece or am I a vapor? And the answer to that question is yes. you both of them. You're a masterpiece, but you're only a vapor. You're a vapor, but you're still a masterpiece. In other words, it's perspective. You have to know that we're here for a minute. If you live for 120 years, you're only here for a minute. It's just like a mist. It's going to pass away just like this. It's just a mist. It'll, it, it come and it goes just like this. But also, you're his masterpiece, and he wants you to do something with the life that he's given you. I want you to do something with this life. I, I've given you this life for a reason. It, it's, it's not just by happenstance that you're here. I created you on purpose. I created you with a purpose. I created you to do great things for me. I created you to be on an assignment. I created you with, with, with my, my glory in, in mind. I, I created you with something for you to do. Before you was formed in your mother's belly, I knew you. I created you. I formed you. I chose you. There is something that I have for you to do. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. He says, the 72 returned with joy because Jesus sent them out to evangelize. He sent out 72 disciples to go and evangelize. And he said, the Bible said, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's what Jesus said. He said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Because they're excited about, man, do you not know what we saw? These people was rejoicing. These people was getting saved. I'm talking about, look, Jesus, we laid hands on one man, and he was sick, and then he got up and he recovered. This man couldn't move, and we touched him, and he was able to move again. God did some amazing things through us, and Jesus was like, awesome. Awesome job. Awesome. Awesome. That's cool. Rejoice in that. That's all right. He said, listen, however, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you. He said, don't, 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 don't rejoice that the Spirit submitted to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So don't be so excited because you was able to cast out the devils. But be excited because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what we need to celebrate about. That's what we need to get on, stand up and clap about. That's what we need to say, God, I bless your holy name because my name is written in heaven because I know you. That's what it's all about. It's just the extra. What I do for you now is just extra. It's just extra. But you need to rejoice that your name is written in heaven. What do I do while I'm here? What do I do while I'm here? Because I'm here with a purpose. I know that I'm just a vapor, but, but I'm also his masterpiece. So what do you want me to do? Because I think when we talk about living it up, oftentimes we only think about living it up from a negative standpoint. And people live it up. I'm, I'm a drug dealer. I'm living it up. I'm, I'm clubbing. I'm, li- I'm sleeping with everybody. I'm living it up. I'm out here buck wild and I'm living it up. I'm a party animal. I'm living it up. The prodigal son, he's living it up. And so we, we associate living it up with negativity. I'm living it up. But, but how about when God saved you, we start living it up on this side? 
Some of you lifted up on the other side, but you got on this side and you just became boring. You got on this side, you became stale. You got on this side and, and you don't have a sense of humor. You got on this side and you're just too holy for your own good. And, and my God, how about we live it up on this side? God, I want to live it up on this side. I want to live it up. God, I still, I still can ride jet skis. God, I still can go to the mountains. I still can hang out. I still can have a good time. I still can swim. I still can live it up. I'm going to live it up in you, God. I can live it up while I'm ministering. I can live it up while I'm talking to people. I, I, I'm living it up in you. How about you live it up on this side? We get to this side and we just, we don't want to live it up. And, and we become, some of us get so frustrated. You act like you mad that God saved you. Because it's some stuff that you wanted to do. And you got on this side and you just frustrated and you mad. And you wish he'd just, just take me. You just, just, my God, live it up. But some of us, we didn't live it up on the other side or this side. You just living a life you never live it up. I don't want you to, I'm not condoning living it up on the other side. But on this side, it's time to, to live it up. Let's live it up. Luke chapter 19, verse 12 and 13. And many of you heard this before when Jesus was talking about the talents or the minors. And he said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minors. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. He said, look, I'm, I'm going to give you these 10 minors. I want you all to put this money to work until I come back. He gave 10 people 10 minors. He put the money to work. The first one came back. The first one came back and he said, with the one that you gave me, he gave, he gave all 10 of them one. And the first one, he said, with this one that I gave you, Jesus, I put it to work and I came back with 10 more. And, and, and the other one who came back, he said, you gave me one, but I came back with five. And the other one that he gave one to, and he gave 10, but he only talks about the three in this particular passage. He gave him one and he came back with the one. He said, I buried it. He said, I buried it. I didn't do anything with it. And Jesus was frustrated because he buried it. Verse 19 says, the man said, I was afraid of you, my God. He said, so I didn't do anything with the gift that you've given me because I was afraid of you. So I didn't move. So I just stayed still. So I didn't do anything. So I just procrastinated. So I just danced around it. So I just made excuses why I couldn't get done. He said, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and, and you reap what you did not sow. My God. Jesus, let me tell you what happened. The man who was given one and came back with ten, he was given ten cities. The man who was given one and came back with five, he was put over five cities. If you're faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. But the one that was given one and came back with only one, that one that he had was taken away from him. It was taken away from him. He was upset with this man. He said, this man got to be punished because of what he did, because of his fear, because of his lack of movement, because he didn't go forward, because he was afraid to do something what God had given him. He said, occupy until I come. I've given you these things now. Now, now occupy. Occupy until I come. In other words, do something what I've given you. I've given you gifts. I've given you talents. I've given you, I've given you something to do. Now occupy. Now put this to work. Put your gift to work. Put your talent to work. Use what I've given you. Use your mouthpiece. Use your hands. Use your voice. Put what I've given you to work. Put what I've given you to work. And the man didn't put it to work, and so it was taken from him. So, so what's keeping you from living it up? What's keeping you from living? I'm talking about living a life to the fullest for God, living a kingdom life for God, getting on this side and say, God, I'm going to give you everything that I got. I'm going to leave it all on the field. I'm going to leave it all on the earth. I'm, gonna leave, I'm giving you everything that I got, every gift that you've given me, I'm staring it up. Everything that you've put in me, God, I'm, 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 I'm going forward with it, God. God, if you gave it to me, God, God, then I'm going to give it back to you, God. That's my gift to you, God, to, uh, to allow this gift that you've given me, God, to be used for your glory. A couple of reasons why we're not living it up. A couple of reasons, and we're going to say amen, why we're not living it up. Number one, procrastination. Now, I won't talk a lot about procrastination because we've talked about procrastination, but some of us are not living it up because we procrastinate. So you don't, you don't, you don't exercise your gift because you, you, you're a procrastinator. Some of us are habitual procrastinators. I'm going to let y'all type something in right here. I know y'all, yeah. 
Some of y'all saying, ouch. Some of y'all know it hits you because it's like, my God, that's been, I, I'm gifted, I'm smart, I'm talented. There's a lot in me, but I am a habitual procrastinator. If procrastination was a crime, I'd be in jail because that's what I do. Procrastination, many have realized it to be a coping mechanism. When people procrastinate, they're avoiding emotionally unpleasant tasks and instead doing something that provides a temporary mood boost. The procrastination itself then causes shame and guilt, which in turn leads people to procrastinate even further, creating a vicious cycle. You got to stop procrastinating. Proverbs 10 and 4 says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. If you ain't doing nothing, you're going to be broke. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Listen to this right here. This one article said, you start to doubt and question what is wrong with you. You might desperately ask yourself, why, why, can't, I, why can't I just do it? Why can't I just, just do, do what I'm supposed to do? When you keep saying you would do something and you don't, your reputation inevitably gets tarnished. And nobody wants empty promises. Besides damaging your own reputation, you are damaging your self-esteem and self-confidence. You will find that it gets easier to procrastinate each time because you are not surprising yourself anymore, my God. So every time you procrastinate, it makes it easier to procrastinate even more because you're not even surprising yourself anymore. Having low self-esteem destroys lives in many ways. When we have low self-esteem, we hold ourselves back. We feel less than we should and it leads to self-sabotaging acts. Procrastination eats away at your confidence, slowly but surely. When you procrastinate, you make decisions based on criteria that most likely wouldn't be there if you didn't procrastinate. My God. Like pressure to finally make a decision because time is running out. So then you end up making the wrong decision because you waited so late to make the decision and now and you, you procrastinated so now you end up making the wrong decision because time is running out and you just, you have to make a decision now. People could stop depending, listen, people could stop depending on you and hold back on offering you opportunities because they could be worried that you will simply procrastinate and they will be left to clean up the mess. My God, is that you? Is that you? Is that you? People say, listen, we're not even going to ask her to do it because she's good, but she's going to be late. She's good, but it's going to be at the last minute. She's good, but she's going to be running in with it right before we start. He's good, but, but I don't know if I can trust. Now, when I see it, it is going to be amazing, but I don't know when I'm going to see it. I may see it five minutes before it starts, and I can't make the proper changes that I need to make, so I don't even want to ask the best person. I get the less talented individual to do it because I can't trust this individual because they're habitual procrastinators. My God. Procrastination is linked to stress and anxiety, and these in turn are linked to health issues. If your procrastination leads to feelings of depression, over time this procrastination will start to affect other areas of your life. You put off doctor's appointment and working out because you, you procrastinate. Procrastination is a passive resistance. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. And some of us are waiting for perfect conditions. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on the right time, but the right time is never coming. I'm waiting on the right moment, but the right moment is never coming. You have to create the moment. You have to create the time. You have to move forward. When, when, when I'm, I'm ill-equipped, I don't have it. Sometimes you just got to move forward. Some of you would like to rephrase it and say, well, really, I'm a perfectionist. You're waiting on the right moment. But, but listen, people that deal with you, this is what they call it. They call it something else. They call it lazy. They say that they don't want to work with you because they don't know what to expect out of you. So you have a definition of it, and they got a definition of it. Your definition is just, I just want to make sure everything is right. But people around you definition of it is we can't trust you to do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. That's an ouch moment.
Because is there you? Is there you? I know some of us, we know some people like that, but you got to ask yourself, is that me? Am I the person? Am I the person that he's talking about? Am I the person that people say, I, I'm good, I'm talented, but uh, I'm good, but I'm going to get it done when I want to get it done. It's going to be last minute. I'm barely going to get it done. It's going to be late. It's going to be awesome, but we're going to be just running in, and when the program starts, then it's just, no, my God, no. That, that can't, I have to change that about myself so I can't live it up. I can't live life to the fullest, and I can't really maximize what God has given me because I'm a procrastinator. Some of us, we, we desire to live our lives to the fullest, but what, what keeps us from doing that it's procrastination and being unorganized, disorganized. Unorganized is not organized without organic structure, not formed into organic or systematized whole. So you're just all over the place. Some of us, we can't move forward because we, we, we have no order. You have, like, that's your problem. You have no order in your life. And so you just get up and you just go. And this is over here and that's over there. And this look like this and that look like that. And your closet look like this and your car look like this and your room look like this. And, you, and it's just no organized. There's no rhyme or reason. You just get up and you just move and you just go. You good. And when we see you, we don't, we don't, we don't know how, because you look nice and you smell nice. And you just, had, you just got a haircut. But there's no organization about you. And you can't reach your fullest potential because you're unorganized. Listen, organi organization is about making room for the things in your life that are truly important. Our life priorities, it will bring freedom. When you prioritize, it brings you freedom. Listen, a disorganized person is a defeated person. And no matter who we are, if we aren't organized, we'll never accomplish as much as we could. Because if we're always disorganized, we'll never accomplish everything God wants us to. You can't accomplish what God wants you to because you're not organized. And so I'm not living my life to the fullest. I'm not, I'm not living it up because I'm disorganized. And so I can't really give God everything that he needs. I can't, he's giving me a gift, but I can never really maximize this gift and this talent that God has given me because I'm disorganized, my God. So, so being organized is not just something just cute. I just got to get more organized. When you're not organized, you can't, you can't properly give God what God is looking for, how he need it. Because you, you, you're not organized and you, you're not prioritizing. He might get your time, but he might not get your time. But he'll never really get your best. Being organized isn't something that, that just happens. For most of us, it takes determination and discipline. What's the one decision? Listen, I, I, I was... A friend of mine sent me some information about this guy who wrote The Compound Effect. And he has what we call Darren Daly. His name is Darren. And he, he, he communicated something that was really powerful and impactful to where I shared it with our staff and I shared it with our leaders. And I want to share a little bit with you now. But, but he, he communicated this, which was profound. He said, listen, what's one decision that you can make today they can eliminate thousands in the future. Let me say that again. What's one decision that you can make today that can eliminate thousands in the future? So what, what can I make today? What, what decision can I make today that will eliminate other decisions in the future? He talked about this. He said uh, one of his friends called him about, about serving on this particular board or making this particular investment. And this guy was a multi-billionaire. And he said had he made the investment and everything went right, he could have potentially made X amount of dollars. I mean, crazy amount of money. But he had to tell the man no. Because one of the things that he said, he made a decision about a long time ago, is that he won't invest in anything else but his company. So it doesn't matter how good it looked, he's not even taking the risk to invest in anything else but his company. So he didn't do it. He said he made a decision to say no to sugar. So that means every birthday party, every wedding that you have, it does not matter. It doesn't matter who you are. He doesn't eat sugar, so he's not going to eat any of your cake because he's already made that decision. So he doesn't have to think, am I going to eat this? Am I going to eat that? Am I going to eat this? No, nope. he made a decision that he would not eat bread again. He made a decision that he would not do any podcasts. He said, I'm not doing any more podcasts. I'm not forwarding anyone else's book. I'm not taking any speaking engagements unless I'm traveling to that place 
anyway, and when I travel to their place, then I'll take the speaking engagement. He said, if it's not in line with his vision, then he's not doing it. So that one single decision eliminated thousands of decisions in the future. Because I said one to this decision, listen, I'm not serving on any other boards. So it doesn't matter who asked me to serve on their board, I'm not serving on the board. So I don't have to think and say, well, he cool and she cool, but they not cool, so let me try to maneuver. No, I'm not serving. I made that one decision. So now it can help me to make thousands of other decisions. I, I, this is what I eat, so I don't have to think through what I'm going to eat. He said that I made a decision not to lend out money. He said, so he don't lend out money. He said, now, he's a giver, I, I, I believe, and he said, I give money. So if my friends need money and I have the money to give, I give money. But he made a decision, so it's not personal. So they have to think, am I going to let them borrow this money and them not borrow this money? Nope, I don't lend money, period. That one decision. What's that one decision that you need to make today that will eliminate thousands of decisions in the future? Oftentimes, we don't want to make that decision. You have to make that decision. Nope, we're not doing this. I don't do this. I don't date anybody that's married. I don't date anybody that's got 10 kids or whatever that is. You make that one decision. And you don't have to think through, well, I know I said I wasn't going to date anybody with 10 kids, but they got 10 kids, but, no, it's not in it, but if you got 10 kids or if you've been married or whatever your criteria is, make that decision. And it'll save you time. It'll eliminate thousands of decisions that you need to make in the future. I got to be more organized. Look at somebody and say, I got to be more organized. I got to be more organized. I got to get organized. That's what's been plaguing me. That's what's been holding me down. My lack of organization, my disorganized self. I got to get better. I got I to put a system in place. I got to get better in my ministry. I got to get better in my business. I got to get better in what God called me to. I have to get better in my personal life. I got to get better with my children. I got to get better with my spouse. I have to get better. I have to be better. I have no rhyme or reason. I just get up. I don't have any system. And especially this quarantine been going on. I may do the votes, and I may not do the votes. I may do this, I may not, I may read, I may not read. I have to have a system. There needs to be organization in your life so that you can give God your best. Listen, men have said yes to something, but hadn't really said no to anything else. When you say yes to someone, you ask something else on your plate, the question you have to answer is, what am I going to say no to? I've said yes to this, so how did I, now I'm, I'm already busy. My, my plate is already full. So when I say yes to any other thing, I need to ask myself, what am I going to say no to? And many times we don't do that. We just say yes, yes, yes. We yes men and yes women. And then, oh, they, ooh, I'm so, I'm, I'm, thank you for asking me. And yes, but, but I have to, to, to adjust my life and say, if I say yes to this, I have to be willing to say no to something else. And what are you willing, what's in your life that you're doing that you're willing to say no to? When I said yes to pastoring, I had to say no to coaching, though I love coaching. But I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't do both at the same time at the level that I was coaching and be successful. So I said yes to pastoring and no to coaching. Something else as big had to get off of my plate. I call it responding to my bigger yes. Some of us, we're too loyal to our old habits, though. So that's, you're too loyal to your old habits, and, and, and because you're so loyal to your old habits, you, you can't break them, and, and you, can't, you can't really be free, so you can't move forward and be what God truly called you to be. You want to advance, but you don't want to let anything go. You want what's in the future, but you, you're not willing to let anything go that's in the past. You want to be married, but you still got your old way of thinking. I got to let some stuff go. If I'm going to move forward, I got to let my old way of thinking go. You're still trying to pour new wine in the old wine skin, and it's not, it's not going to work. I have to have priority in my life. I can't think the way that I used to think. I am a professional, and I have to think different. There's things that God has called me to do, and I have to have some organization in my life. I have a pretty busy schedule, praise God, but, but I try and do the important things first and have priority in my life. I talked about the quadrant before, the, the four quadrants, in, and, and it's about prioritizing your life. It's about that balance, and balance is difficult, but it's really about that priority, having a priority in your life. You have to have a juggling act because sometimes I'm a great father, sometimes I'm just a good father because I'm too busy being, or so busy being, trying to be a great husband, or I'm busy in the ministry, so I have to balance. But what keeps me somewhat balanced is having priority. In other words, what I mean is God first. 
He has his time. You first on the list, making sure that you give God his time. Wife next, she get her time. Kids, family next, they get their time. And then ministry. When you have things in that order, you can be effective. But oftentimes we get things out of order. And you put church before family. And that's out of order. And you put family before God. And that's out of order. And you put kids before spouse. And that's out of order. So I got to have priority. I have to have organization, priority in my life. What keeps you from living life to the fullest, what keeps you from, from living it up is procrastination, is being unorganized, and the last thing is, is the fear factor. It's a fear factor that keeps you from moving forward. You haven't achieved greatness because of the fear factor, and you got to get rid of fear. Fear is, is, fear is serious. You got you to get rid of it. It's serious. Listen, fear is powerful enough to keep us from achieving our goals and living our best lives. It feeds stagnation and keeps us from taking advantage of opportunities. Many people are living in self-made prisons of their own fears. A life lived without fear is not only something we all deserve. It is something that is completely possible for all of us without exception. We don't want to simply tolerate our fears, but we want to eliminate them. Now, some fear is good fear, and we, that comes from God to, to, to give us the fight or flight sense of, uh, of, of movement, and, 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 and when some things happen, and we need to know, okay, that, that, that's an animal, so I need to understand it. There needs to be something that rises up in me to know what I need to do and how I need to operate, but oftentimes we operate with the bad fear, and we fear things that we shouldn't fear, and we fear people that we shouldn't fear. Listen to this article I read. It says, what is fear but deeply ingrained doubts, years of caution, planted by others, and vulnerable minds planted and maintained by others until you're old enough to take over the task. Before you know it, fear runs free and unsupervised. Like an unruly, insecure child, messages delivered by parents, brothers, sisters, bosses, clergy, spouse, friends, crowds, crowds out hopes, dreams, and possibilities. Messages started by others and cultivated by you. Day in and day out, year after year, plastered in your mind. Listen to this. Before you know it, the small child within makes decisions for the adult that you've become. The small child within you makes the decisions for the adult that you've become. The validation seeker disguised as someone there to protect us from harm makes the rules. The approval seeker there to keep you physically and emotionally safe is making decisions, vetoing bills, and turning away decent dreams just to keep you free of the fear of failing. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But this is what we operate in fear, and it keeps us from moving. It keeps us stagnant. It keeps us at the same place. What we think about, what we watch, what we listen to, it all matters. Even the conversations that we have with others, what we allow into our eyes and our ears that seeps down into our souls is the most important decisions we'll ever make each and every day. We fear failure. We fear success. We fear rejection. We fear being embarrassed. And it keeps us in this place to where we cannot live it up. We cannot live life to the fullest because of fear. So oftentimes we procrastinate because of fear. What is it that God has called you to do? What assignment has God has given you that you've continued to put off? You've been, in the last time we talked about this, when we talk from I'm on assignment, some of you have, have started doing something and you got ignited and you, and you got motivated and you got inspired and it, it has fizzled out already. And you stopped living your life. How many sermons you going to need to reignite you, to get you back on point, to make you focus on the main thing? And it's not just about your grind and your business and you moving forward. I'm not talking, I'm, now if your grind is, 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 is God, a God-given gift that you're using 
for his glory. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you just going and you getting money and you grinding and you moving. I'm, not, I'm talking about you using your gift that God has given you. you maximizing everything that God has put in you and you're using it for his glory. You're occupying until he comes. You're telling somebody about Jesus. Your life is a, a, is a living witness. It's an epistle for him. That's what it's about. At the end of the day, it's not about our grind. Now, when you get on God's side, you need to grind for him. But I'm telling my folks, it's just grind to say they grind it. I'm telling my folks, man, I'm making moves. I'm, I'm, no, no, I, I'm talking about people that say, God, I want to do what you call me to do. I want to be what you call me to be. I'm giving everything that I got, God. My grind is for you, God. God, I want to shine for you, God. God, matter of fact, God, I don't even want to shine for you. I want you to shine through me. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify God, which is in heaven. You got to know that I am here for a reason. I'm here on purpose. I'm here to do what God has called me to do. That's why I'm here. 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 And I got to move forward. I got to move forward. I got to move forward. This is what I get sick and tired of. You got some people who don't know God, but they, they, they act like they fearless. They don't even know God. They don't know him at all, and, 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 and they give everything that they got. They, they have no fear. They don't fear God, and they don't fear anything else. They, but they moving, and they making moves. And you looking at them like they the one. They not the one. But then you also have people who, who fear God, but you got so many other fears as well that you don't move. And they ain't the one. I believe what God is looking for is people that fear him, but don't fear this other stuff. That fear him and say, God, I fear you, but, but I'm not walking in fear of the things that you've called me to do. If you call me to do it, I'm doing it. If you call me to go forward, I'm going forward. If you call me to move, I'm moving. If you call me to write, I'm writing. If you call me to sing, I'm singing. If you call me to play, I'm playing. If you call me to do drama, I'm doing drama. If you call me to produce, I'm producing. If you call me to move and execute those things that you call me to, that is what I am going to do, God. I'm sick and tired of putting my gift on the shelf. I'm sick and tired of putting my book on the shelf. I'm sick and tired of putting my talent on the shelf. Excuse after excuse excuse after excuse I'm talking about just procrastinating after procrastinating just allowing my ideas to be shot down they didn't believe in me he didn't believe in me she didn't believe in me this happened so we had to push it back but the devil is a lie I'm not pushing it back another week I'm not pushing it back another month I'm not pushing it back another year I will do what you have called me to do you've given me something you put it in me God it's time for me to stir up the gift listen some of you are looking for God to stir up a gift in you but I'm here to tell you that God is not in the business of stirring up the gift that's in you. You got to stir up the gift that God has given you. My God, he's given you the gift. You want him to stir it up too? If he gave you the gift, you got to stir it up. God, you've given me the gift, God. So I got to stir up the gift that you've given me, God. I got to move, God. I got to get back where I need to be, God. I got to get back in the place that I need to get in, God. I'm tired of procrastinating, God. I'm tired of being unorganized. And I'm tired of walking in fear. I just got to move. I just got to go in the midst of me being scared. I got to I got to jump in the midst of me being afraid. I got to go anyway. Some of you are waiting on the fear to leave before you go. You got to jump in the midst of your fear. You got to record in the midst of your fear. You got to sing in the midst of your fear. You got to go in the midst of your fear. Sometimes the fear may not ever leave, but you got to go anyway. When Peter walked on the water, I don't believe that he was fearless when he walked on the water, but he walked on the water in the midst of his fear. When Abraham left where, oh my God, when he left where he was supposed to, to leave and go where he was supposed to go, I don't believe that he was fearless. I believe that he did it in the midst of his fear. My God, he did it. I'm fearful, but I'm going anyway. Gideon, I'm fearful, but I'm doing it anyway. I'm fearful. David, I'm fearful, but I'm doing it anyway. I can talk bad. I know what God can do, but there's something in David that could have been a little fearful. But it didn't matter about the fear. I'm going to do it anyway. Do it anyway. Write it anyway. Sing it anyway. Post it anyway. Do what he's called you to do anyway. I got to do it in the midst of my fear. My God, I'm not going to let fear stop me. I'm not going to let fear keep me down. I'm not going to let Corona, I'm not going to let nothing stop me from moving forward and doing what I know that God has called me to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm living it up. It's time that I live it up. I got to live it up. I'm tired of 
second place. I'm tired of mediocrity. I'm tired of second best. I'm tired of just moseying along. I gotta live it up. He called me to live it up. He, called, he got upset with the one man who only broke back one minor. He said, all you got is one. All you broke back is one. In other words, you hadn't been living it up. If God calls some of you home right now, my God, would he be excited that you broke back 10 minors? Or would he say, all you got is this one? This is all you've done with all of this time, with all of these resources that I've given you, with all of this teaching, with all of this preaching, with all of this training that I've given you. This is all that you got to show for it. That devil is a lie. I'm moving forward. I'm giving my everything. If I've never given my everything before, I'm giving it right now. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, I said I was going to do it before, but this is my time. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for stirring me up, God. Thank you for shaking me up. Thank you for jacking me up. Thank you for loving me enough, God, to tell me that I got to get back in position. I got to get back on assignment. I got to get back in my place and move forward and do what you called me to do. Don't take the gift from me, God. Don't take the gift from me, God. God, I'm going to use it. Give me one more time. Give me one more chance, God. You ain't got to spank me no more, God. Give me one more chance. I will do what you have called me to do. I'm going to work what's in my hand. Y'all ain't going to have no church. I'm going to work what's in my hand. I told you before, don't wait on the big camera. Go and get a phone. Go and get a flip phone. Get an iPhone. Whatever you got. Start with what's in your hand. I don't care. Don't wait on the big camera. You, if you got to go and get one of them paper cameras, if they still sell the paper cameras at Walgreens, get a paper camera. I'm going to start with that. I'm going to post it online. I'm going to take somebody pictures. Somebody going to let me take their pictures. God, you've called me, God. You've given me creativity, God. And I've been hiding it under the shelf. I've been hiding it in the ground. Get your shovel, my God. Get your shovel out. Get your shovel out. Dig it up. Dig it up. Get your gift off the ground. Get it out of the ground. Get it out of the ground. Dust it off. Move forward. Go and do what God has called you to do. This is my season. This is my season. Come on, tell somebody. This is my season. I'm getting ready to live it up. I'm getting ready to live it up. I'm getting ready to give everything that I got. I'm getting ready to live my life to the fullest. I hadn't been living because I've been procrastinating, because I've been unorganized, because I've been walking in fear. I'm getting ready to live it up. I'm living it up. Come on and give God some praise. I'm getting ready to live it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm living it up. I'm living it up. I'm getting off the bench. I'm getting off the bench. I'm supposed to be in the game, but I'm watching everybody else go. I'm supposed to be in the game. I'm not jealous of you running your touchdowns. I'm not jealous of you throwing your touchdowns. I'm not jealous of you making your sacks. But I do know that God has given me something. And I've been warming the bench up for too long. I've been sitting over here for too long. I've been watching y'all run up and down the field for too long. I've been trying to see if y'all gonna get hurt. And if y'all gonna get hurt, that'll justify me sitting on the bench. I've been seeing if y'all gonna score. And what's gonna happen if y'all score? But I've been sitting on, on the bench, whether you score or not. Whether you get hurt or not, I've been on the bench too long. In other words, God put me in the game. Put me in the game. Coach, put me in the game. You're prepared for this. You're made for this. Get in the game. Get in the game. It doesn't matter what happened before you. It doesn't matter if they score touchdowns, if they got hurt, if they got sacked. It doesn't matter. You ain't them. Get in the game and use the gift that God has given you. Live it up. Live it up. It's time for me to live it up. I'm living to the fullest. I got to live my life to the fullest. It's time to live it up. Hallelujah. 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 Woo, I got to live it up. I got to live it up. I got to live it up. Taking folks out the house. Taking them to, to, the, to the hospital. Taking them to the hospital. And, and, and for some people, that's it. That's it. And some people never fulfill their, their purpose, never truly live their lives, never live their lives to the fullest. It's time to live it up. It's time to live it up. In these uncertain times, what you waiting on? Well, I'm just going to 
you know, uh, what I'm going to do. See, uh, I'm just, I was just, uh, said that in the end it's not the years in your life that count but it's the life in your years so it's not the years in your life it's the life in your years what kind of life in your years what are you doing with the years that God has given you we talked about before that dash that we got a start date and a finish date and we all have it what are you doing in that dash are you living in that dash? Don't die twice. Just dying now. Just going through the motion now. And then you die. Live twice. Live now and then live again with Jesus. Give everything that you got. Talking to just our staff and some individuals and talked about Miss Sandra, our, our assistant, and she's in her late 50s and, and she is turned. She, she's on staff with, I mean, she, she's the oldest person on our staff. We have millennials on our staff. I think the youngest person may be 28 years of age. And she got more energy or just as much energy as anybody on the staff. When it's time to go and ride scooters, bam, sign me up. If folks riding jet skis, sign me up. Whatever it is, she's, she's busy in the Lord. And we talked about it the other night because she was busy in the world before. But now she's busy in the Lord. She's using everything that she got to glorify. God, I want to glorify you. If I can assist, if I can help, then that's what I want to do. If, I, if, 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 it's, if it's a need, then I want to, I'm single, I'm not married, I don't have anybody to report to. So I can have an all-night lock-in with the young ladies. I can tell them about Jesus. I can go and hang out. I can go out and eat. I can have fun. I can live it up in the Lord. Cause she used to live it up with the enemy, but now she's I'm living it up in the Lord. Some of us have that freedom. Live it up. Live it up in the Lord. And even those that's married, don't allow that to be a prison for you. Live it up. Live it up. Make every moment count with your spouse, with your children. Make it count. Live it up. Travel. Hang out. Have family night. I told my wife, I said, listen, I want to make sure that we have family night, and we call it family night. And she said, baby, we hang out all the time. Let's just hang. And I said, no, this is what I want to do. I want us to label it family night. Because when our kids grow up, I want them knowing that we took time out for them. In the midst of everything that we have going on, in the midst of traveling and going out of town and ministering and us being together and doing and, and, and helping to build a kingdom, they knew that their night was their night. And we gave them our undivided attention. And we labeled it family night. Because even if we spend time, some kids can just get it twisted and just, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. We were just together. No, we had family night. And then we still spend time together. Live it up. Man, let's hang. Let's live it up. Let's give God everything that we got. It's election season. And some of us are married to a Democratic party. And some of us are married to a Republican party. And we act like we're losing our mind as believers. And we don't act like the world act. My salvation is not in Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It's in Jesus. Some of you act like you trust in the elephant or you trust in the donkey. Some trust in horses. 
Some trust in chariots. Some trust in a donkey. Some trust in an elephant. But as people of God, we have to trust in Jesus. Period. That's who we live our lives for. That's who we trust in. So regardless of who the president is, we trust in God. Period. People of God, let's live it up. Get off the bench. Get in the game. Get your shovel. Pull your gift out the ground. And move. Put me in, coach. I'm ready, coach. I'm ready. I hadn't been living. I've just been existing, but it's time that I live. I got some dash left in me, and it's time that I live. Live, people of God. Living it up. I'm living it up. I'm living it up. Travel. Hang out. Type in, it's time to live. It's time I start living. Some of you around here, you got attitudes. Your mouth be poked out. You mad at your spouse all the time. You mad at the kids. You everything just, just, just weigh you down. You don't know if the kids going back to school. The kids not. No, no, those are real issues that you have, and it's real, real concerns. But you stay in that state of frustration, that state of disorganized, that state of just discombobulated. You live. Some of you live there. You just stay frustrated. It's just something always with you. The problem is not the circumstance. The problem is not with your spouse. The problem is not with your children. The problem is not with COVID-19. The problem, the problem is, is you. And you have to find peace in your life. And you have to find joy in your life. The joy of the Lord needs to be your strength. It's always something, but not anymore. I'm getting ready to live it up. It's my time now. It's my season. Put me in the game, coach. Put me in the game. I'm stirring up the gift that God has given me. And I'm getting ready to live it up in Jesus' name. If you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, I'm saved. Simple as that. Thank you for saving me. I've been wasting my time on social media and strolling hours on top of hours on social media. Looking at other people in the game, looking at, let me put this energy into my business, into my ministry, into what God has called me to do. That's what Darren was saying. He said that I'm putting, he don't, he don't do social media, period. He said, I'm putting all of that energy into what I'm called to do. And I don't even know if this man is a Christian or not. But if he's putting it into his business and I can't put it into the kingdom, shame on me. Shame on us as people of God. If he said no to all of these things so he can invest in his business. But we can't say no to anything to invest in God. If you're backslidden and want to come back to Jesus you to say, God, accept me back. God, accept me back. I want to come back to you. I want to come back to you in Jesus' name. Let's live it up. God bless. If you chose Jesus as your Lord, may Innovation Church your home, or if you would like prayer, please click the link and we'll connect you with the member from our team. It's giving time. And listen, remember, you don't have to give, but you get to give. We don't have to give, but we get to give here at Innovation Church. Listen, the Word of God communicates this clearly, that if you give, it will be given unto you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give unto your bosom. Bring your tithes into the storehouse, not a fifth, not a seventh, but a tenth of your increase, at least to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. See if I won't open up the wonders of heaven and part of blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. Be sure to click the link and give God your best.
If this message has blessed you, be sure to share it with a family member or a friend and invite them to experience our online worship experience next Sunday. I'm Pastor Myron, and you have just experienced innovation.